work on a lot. There's a text editor I've been writing built on the, the uh, Shiny framework. But I'm not here to talk to you about that because you know how text editors work. Um, I am here to give a brief introduction to the standard testing package, which is part of Go. And um, I think it's something that every Go developer should know pretty well. Uh, does anyone here do a lot of testing with Go or use the Go testing package? So Go developers talk a lot about the great tooling in Go, and I think Go test is a big part of that. Go test, Go get, Go build, et cetera. Um, this is going to be an overview of test, which is an important part of it. Uh, so what is so special about testing in Go? It's a first class part of the language. Um, there's a quote from, I think it was Rob Pike, maybe Dave Cheney, that said, testing in Go is testing in Go. If the rest of the quote says, if you don't, that means if you don't like writing tests in Go, it means you don't like writing Go. Uh, there's no domain specific language for testing in Go, is what they were getting at with that. It is just Go. Uh, which make it easier to learn, but people who come from other languages often have problems sort of wrapping their head around this and try and, you know, port JUnit or whatever to go. And it's, if you're going to do that, that's fine, but you should understand the idiomatic Go way of doing things before you go down that route, I think. So that's why I'm giving this brief overdoc, uh, overview. Uh, there's tests that can be integrated into Go Docs, which is pretty cool. We'll get to examples of that. There's Benchmarking support right out of the box, which is really easy to do. And it's built into the standard tooling, which I guess is the same as the first point. Um, so how does it actually work logistically? If you have files named underscore test.go in your package, go build will not build them. Go test will build them. Code and your test live alongside each other in the same packages. That's just the convention is underscore test means test. Pretty simple convention. Um, in those test files, you, it, any random Go code can go there, but there are some special functions called test anything, example anything, and benchmark anything, which cover the three use cases that I said earlier. And they each have their own um, signatures. So that, let's dive right in. This is a random test that's really, really useless. Um, it's just an example of how test works. So there's an if statement, a print, and then I you call t.fail to indicate. So test anything takes a testing.t pointer parameter uh, as a parameter, which is just basically something that orchestrates the status of your test. If you call t.fail, it means that your test failed. If you don't call fail, then your test did not fail. It passed. In this case, since we're checking if 1 equals 2, which hopefully will never be the case, if you run go test, it says, hey, it passed. Great. Took 0 0.006 seconds to determine that. Um, fail doesn't even take a, you know, there's not even a message to go with it, which is pretty useless. It's the like, lowest level primitive. So if you're using it, you need to even print your error message yourself. No one really wants to do that. So they have another method called error. According to the documentation, error is the equivalent of log followed by fail. That's basically it's. You give it a string, it will fail with that message. Uh, and I, I guess it's a little to you know, show the output, because if it always just said pass, it would be boring. Uh, in the file test.test.go on line 7, which is this one, there was an error with my error message. It, this one took 0 0.005 seconds to run, which is great, I guess. Um, there's another level that I'm not going to talk about called fail. Fail is the same as error followed by return. So you either fail, you fail with a message, or you fail and just abort the entire test. Um, this is still not entirely useful, though, because you don't want a static string with all your tests. Not, you, know, you want to give more information than that. So there's an error f and fatal f function, too. The f is sort of meant to resemble printf. In fact, in Go, any function that ends with f, if you run go vet, go vet will assume that it's the variant of printf. Um, and we'll detect things like, hey, you know, your number of parameters don't match your, uh, your um, string. So errorf, which is like printf, except the testing package with an error, takes a formatting string. 
V, percent V, if you don't know, is a um, special Go formatting string, which means print this parameter with the most appropriate thing, most appropriate output format that you can think of. So if it's an integer, it's the same as percent D. If it's a string, it's the same as percent S. If it's a uh, stringer interface implementer, it's going to put dot output. Um, so this is getting more useful because now we have information. We have we use an initializer here to call some package we have in the function. This creates a if you don't know too much Go, I'll just go over that. This creates a variable named val that scope to the if statement, and then the semicolon just means and then this is the condition. So it's running this function, assigning this value, doing a check on it, and then within that. It is running. It is using that value to print the error message. That means that you don't need to call it twice. You know, if it's an expensive function, that's probably useful. Uh, and it gives you, you know, your output here. Similar, more useful. But when you, so this is a better way of doing it. But the best way, the way that's mostly done in serious Go, is table-driven testing. This, there's a lot of Go here, so I'll go over it. We're creating, we're Defining a struct in line here, and then we're saying we're having a slice of these structs, and then we're just initializing it to some standard value. So this is basically just like an entirely inline way of defining a table of things that you want to assert on. So this is going to make it a slice of structs of size three. The first one is going to have pram one equals one, pram two equals one param two equals two, et cetera. This is the next row. This is the next one. Um, and if we had some function called something like add two numbers, it would, but presumably is supposed to add two numbers. We're going to range through this slice and make assertions on it. So this is basically the same thing we had in the previous slide, except it's in a for loop. So it's now really trivial to just add test. So this is the, you know, if you have pure functions, this is the best way to do it in Go that I know of, because it's really easy to just add a line here to add a test case. You can add, if we find some edge case, you know, 2 shifted by 31 plus 1 is, we can just add one line here and add to the test case. So that's uh, the basic of the test type of test in Go. There's also, I said there's two other types. The other one is examples. If you look at the Go documentation, if you read that for fun or you're looking at it, you often see things like this, where it has, this is from the HTML package. There's an escape string. It includes an example. This was generated, this entire thing is generated on, if you're not that familiar with GoDocs, this entire thing is generated from the source code. So let's just look at the actual thing here. So this is, so this is an example of how to use this function. It even has a link to the playground where you can you know, play with it, learn how to use it. It's great documentation. I find that when, I, when, they, when documentation have this, I find it's often easier to use than the you know, textual documentation, just because it gives you something solid to work with that you can uh, adapt to your needs. This was all generated, as I said, from the source code. In the source code, all they had to do was define a example function, which is just a function that is an example. It's simple enough. It has a magic comment at the end called output, saying this is what the output of this example should be. So that's great for documentation, but even better, this is also a test case. So um, let's say we have a function like this. It's a greet function. It says, hello. If we have an example and we do go test, go test will run your test for you. So in this case, we had an example. You say greet John will output hello John. It said, hey, we have an example. We know what the output should say. I will check that every time I run go test. If we got that wrong, say we put Jean instead of John, it will say, no, no, this is not right. You said it should output this, but it output this. So it's a very simple way of doing your documentation, uh, doing your test, 
And it's sort of, at first I was not really full of this, but the more I use GoDoc, the more I'm like, kind of examples is really useful. And um, it's cool because it tests for your documentation. So if you do change, make a change that you know your documentation broke, you're no longer doing what you said or telling your users to do, your test cases can catch that. I also just, just discovered today, you can also say that there is unordered output, which is useful if you're doing something like, say you have two go routines in a race condition. You could say, you know, we'll output this line and this line. I don't care what order it's in, it's not deterministic. So, um, so that is how examples work. The last type of test that I talked that I said I was going to talk about was benchmarks. Benchmarks are, you know, pretty simple. Uh, it's very similar to a test, except instead of saying test something, it's benchmark something. Instead of taking a testing P, it takes a testing B. Um, B has a variable name or a member named N, which gets dynamically resized to run the loop that your benchmarks always have this sort of boilerplate, and it basically tells you how long it took to run that loop. Um, the n gets dynamically sized. So in this case, if I, this was this example is from the like testing dot uh, like the testing package, it ran this loop to uh, I think this is 20 million, maybe 200 million times. Uh, 20. It, it ran this 20 million times on average, taking 85.4 nanoseconds per iteration of this loop. The entire thing took 1.805 seconds. Benchmark things like printf most likely, but you will benchmark more complicated things, and just it's there. It's built in the language. It's good to um, good to know that it's there. Just to illustrate that the n is dynamic, I added a sleep here. So it, now it's benchmarking how long it could take per printing, and then sleeping 100 milliseconds. It takes approximately 100 milliseconds more, which isn't entirely surprising. But it also only ran this 10 times. This ran 20 million times. This ran 10 times. After 10 times of running this, it was like, you know what, our numbers are pretty stable. I don't need to keep going. This one thing to keep in mind though is that that means that if your tests take if your benchmarks take longer, it doesn't mean that your tests are worse. This entire thing took 1.1 seconds, it didn't run it very many times. This entire thing took 1.805 seconds because it ran it a lot of times to get a stable number that it can be confident in. I've gotten bitten by that. I spent hours sitting there pulling my head out, being like, why is this code slower? It, I spent so much time optimizing it. And then I actually looked at where the decimal was in the numbers and realized that, oh, this has been telling me that I found that good to know. Um, so those are the three types of tests in Go. As uh, Alex said, I want to throw in some of the more uh, recent Go development. Go 1.7 came out two weeks ago, three weeks ago? Yeah. And well, the previous things have been there since I think 1.2, maybe 1.1. This is new in 1.7. You can now have parallel tests, and you can now have um, uh, subtests. And I think you can have sub sub test arbitrary B. Testing.t has a run function, which you can give a name and a callback function. Callback is the exact same as any other test function, except you usually would want to declare these in line. The reason for that is because then you could share code between different tests instead of duplicating different tests. So if you have something expensive, like saying initializing a database connection, you could just do it up here and then in your closure access it from multiple different tests, and then you, you know, avoid that overhead. If they're going to you can also declare that the test should run in parallel, and because you can run your test in parallel and use the same database time, or you don't care, as long as they're not going to interact in some way. If you don't declare it as in parallel, they are in sequence. Um, so that's uh, you know the new thing in Go testing. The uh, uh, benchmark has a similar sub-benchmark thing, except you can't parallelize benchmark for pretty obvious reasons. Um, so that's my sort of brief overview of the, uh, of the testing framework. I 
when do you use these different types of tests? Is, I, I don't know how to use them, but when do you use them? I can't tell you like any definitive answers, but my personal sort of philosophy is if I don't get something right the first time, I write a test. Because if it's complicated enough that I can't get it right, then I'm going to get it wrong in the future, too. If something is an exported uh, function, it's useful to have example documentations. If I am refactoring something, I always write a benchmark first, because that way I can at least prove to myself that, hey, this refactoring was worthwhile. I can measure it. I can say, this is great. Or horrible, this is a waste of my time. But that is all I have to say for today. So thanks for your time. If you want to look at these slides in the future, this URL is where my computer is right now. And I guess that's that. You, when I do these them, I always run them back to back. Uh, benchmarks, this is the amount of time it took on this computer under this load at this time to run through this loop. You can't compare them across different things. Like, I can't run, I can't run a benchmark and then send you the benchmark and then have you run it. That would just be benchmarking the difference between our computers. So to be sure that, I mean, it takes one second. So to be sure that the numbers are comparable, I always just, you know, Sometimes not commit the benchmark and then check out the previous thing, run it, and then go to forward. But Git will keep two implementations yeah. for me. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, you can run go test dash run. Uh, you give it the name. It, it takes a regular expression, starting with the name of the top level test, and then you reference the subtest with a slash. So you can do like something slash another name will run just this test. Uh, something slash name will run. It's a regular expression, so it might run both of these. I'm not sure. It groups them together. It indents them on level. I, think. I haven't used these too much, so I'm not 100% sure. But in the examples I've seen, they're always grouped together and indented. Oh yes. Um, to run go to run the benchmarks, you need to include the dash bench parameter. And if you don't have any like actual tests, like tests or examples you get this warning if you try running go test just in general. So since it's running go test with no tests and only a benchmark is just open this. If, no, if I had, well, I don't want to say for sure because I'm not 100% sure, but I think if you run dash bench, it will only run the benchmarks. I might be mistaken on that. Yeah, that's true. Are you sure about that? Is that? That is also fun. So he seems pretty confident. So yes, I'll say that's the way it works. Yeah. Yes. This is just asserting what is being printed to standard out. That is all example. I mean, it will also format it into the documentation. But this is just an, this is a magic comment which is asserting standard out will print this. So if you want to you know, say that the output is three, you will have to print three in your example. And then your example will print three, and you're good. Uh, there's one other thing I keep wanting to say and then forgetting. So it can't be that important. Oh, you were asking about the race. Uh, condition, the race detector at the previous slide. There is also a race detector built into the testing framework that you can invoke, but I don't know much about it. So I am not going to make any claims about it. But that is it. Great.